I am sure we all feel a bit shell-shocked since the publication of Pope Francis' apostolic letter, Given Moto Proprio, Traditionis Custodes, and the letter to bishops which accompanied it. I certainly am. I am pleased that Latin Mass Society was able to respond quickly and in the light of careful advice with a document of canonical guidance as well as with statements to the press and a formal statement of our own. Since we got these out, I have been writing quite a lot, which you can find on my blog. And insomniacs will be interested to hear that last week we released an hour-long podcast talk by me, uh, part of our Iota Unum series, trying to make sense of traditionalist custodians in its historical context. And you'll be delighted to hear that I'm not going to go on for nearly as long as that uh, this afternoon. You can find this on the NMS website, Spotify, and various other places. Today, I will try to approach the issue in a complementary way by saying what it means in itself and in practice. So, part one, what does, does tradition as Christianity mean? The letter of the law. Somewhere among his talks and writings, the late Michael Davis, already referred to today, gave us some sound advice of reading documents emanating from the Holy See. Ask yourself, he said, what it allows, which was not previously allowed, and what it forbids, which was not previously forbidden. The rest, he suggested, was just padding. He had in mind documents such as those allowing communion in the hand under Pope Paul VI and the service of the altar by females under Pope John Paul II, which surrounded these permissions with pious wishes that, in effect, people wouldn't use them. Davis was correct in as much as the expressions of theological principles and heartfelt aspirations in these documents made no difference to their legal force. Once something liberals wanted was allowed, it would be all but impossible for bishops and priests opposed to it to resist, and it would become the norm. The same is true when the boot was on the other foot in relation to various permissions for the traditional mass, the English indult of 1971, the worldwide indult of 1984 and 1988, and Summorum Pontificum in 2007. Some people were upset that these documents made references to the theological views of Catholics according attending the traditional mass, as if they were a constant source of suspicion for example, in the 1984 indult, it refers to those attached to the traditional mass in this, in this way. And I quote, that it be made publicly clear, beyond all ambiguity, that such priests and their respective faithful in no way share the positions of those who call in question the legitimacy and doctrinal exactitude of the Roman Missal promulgated by Pope Paul VI in 1970." Unquote. Yes, this was upsetting and unjust and a bit weird in all sorts of ways, but we should keep it in perspective. It was just a way of clawing back a little from the permission that was being given. This clawing back was a matter of pure rhetoric. The idea that anyone could or should try to test the theological purity of mass goers at the door before letting them attend the traditional mass was obviously impractical and indeed ludicrous, even if it was occasionally attempted. It gave the documents the appearance of balance in the sense that it gave something to each side of the debate. But what it gave to Catholics attached to the traditional mass was of actual practical value, and what it gave to their opponents was just warm words. It is somewhat reassuring to apply Michael Davis's analysis to Traditionis Custodes. I won't go into the details of the legislation since we have done that elsewhere, but the long and the short of it is that no bishop is obliged by this document to close down any celebrations of the traditional mass. It is a in a small number of cases, a bishop might feel he should move a celebration from a parish church to a place of worship which is not a parish church. I note that Bishop Mark Davis has done this in the city of Shrewsbury. 
But this applies only to those celebrations which serve a formalized group, quote unquote, of faithful, and should it prove impractical, the obligation can be set aside for the good of souls under the principle expressed by the Code of Canon Law in Canon 87, Section 1. While not forbidding anything previously allowed or allowing anything previously forbidden, the document does give bishops and the Holy See powers did, they did not previously have and transfers oversight of the traditional mass around the curia. The key power to given to bishops is to permit or not his priests to celebrate the traditional mass. We have made the argument that as Traditionis Christus does not abrogate the 1962 Missal and it does not claim to do so, then priests have a right to celebrate it as asserted by Simon Pontificum. In this context, the power of bishops must be understood to apply only to public celebrations. Any priest of the Latin Church retains the right to celebrate the ancient mass in private. As far as public celebrations go, bishops may find this new power convenient, but they were already the moderators of the liturgy <coughs> of their diocese, as Pope Benedict's letter to bishop accompanying Simon Pontificum emphasized. That phrase, of course, comes from the Vatican II document on bishops. As we all know, if a bishop doesn't like what a priest is doing, he has many ways of stopping him doing it ranging from having a quiet word with him to assigning him to an exciting new role on the moon. <laughs> Bishops hostile to public celebrations or traditional mass rarely found it difficult to ensure that they did not take place. In other words, while some bishops may feel greater confidence than before in closing down celebrations which they had never really liked very much, the, the practical difference this power makes is small. Even smaller is the difference made by the new power of the Holy See. At first glance, Traditionis Custodes gives the Holy See the power to veto newly ordained priests being allowed by their bishop to celebrate the traditional mass. On closer inspection, however, tradition is Custodes Article 4 only asks bishops to consult the Holy See about giving newly ordained priests permission. We are given a clue to what the word consult means by the fact that, as the accompanying letter the bishop explains, Traditionis Custodius was composed following a, quote, detailed consultation, unquote, of bishops around the world, some of whom it now transpired never received the questionnaire. So, part two, the spirit of the law. Listeners may be thinking, however, that some departure from Michael Davis's approach is necessary in dealing with this particular document, although in terms of what it allows and forbids, it arguably makes very little difference. There is something about the spirit of the document which is significant and will make a difference. For example, it transfers responsibility for the oversight of the traditional mass away from the congregation for the doctrine of the faith to the Congregation for Divine Worship and of the communities and priestly institutes attached to the traditional mass to the Congregation for Religious. Such purely administrative tech changes can make a big difference because of the difference between officials in the different dicasteries. I'm not going to speculate about what difference this may make in practice. Not only do we not know what the officials currently in post there will do, but there is no telling how long they will remain in post and who will succeed them. I will only recall that during the period when tra traditional mass matters were dealt with by an independent curial entity, the Pontifical Commissioner Claser Day, the University of Pont Federation twice found itself faced with cardinal presidents who took the view that their job was to close the traditional mass down as diplomatically as possible. This precipitated major arguments with, Anto with Cardinal Antonio Innocenti in 1992 and his successor, Cardinal Angelo Felici, in 1999. The point being that it wasn't all roses back then. 
Another way the document can make a difference beyond its precise legal implications is in giving the general impression of approval or non-approval with regard to the traditional mass. This, after all, was the main way that Samorum Pontificum made a difference. Bishops and priests and lay Catholics alike became aware, thanks to this document, Samorum Pontificum, that the value of the traditional mass was officially recognized and that there was no disloyalty in getting involved with it. It is an interesting fact that the indults of 1971, 1984, and 1988 did not have this effect. Many factors influenced this outcome, but a key one was the difference between the generation of bishops and senior clergy who received the earlier indults and the more open-minded generation who received some more pontificum and continued to implement it in the succeeding years. Another factor is that there was an important constituency of bishops and clergy who saw loyalty to the Pope as absolutely crucial to staving off liturgical and doctrinal chaos. Those bishops and priests needed a really clear signal from the Pope that this Mass was okay before they would permit or celebrate it, and that is exactly what they got. What exciting times they were! The immediate aftermath of Samorum Pontificum. The Latin Mass Society's priest training conferences were huge and the number of celebrations rocketed. It was clear that we were dealing with pent up demand. A whole group of priests who were willing to begin celebrating the traditional Mass as soon as they heard the starting pistol. Will the spirit of Traditionis Custodes have a similar effect in the opposite direction? Will a large body of priests and bishops who have been celebrating the traditional mass or simply witnessing its effects read that the official favour of the Holy See for it has been withdrawn after 14 years for reasons which are somewhat opaque and decide that they should have nothing to do with it from now on? Is there a parallel pent-up demand to stop celebrating and indeed attending the mass today? as there had been to celebrate and attend it then? Is there a parallel attitude among an influential body of clergy and bishops that they should put aside their personal feelings because only obedience to the Holy Father can stave off chaos and confusion about all sorts of issues of discipline and doctrine? No. There is no such thing as a pent-up demand not to do what something no one is forcing you to do. Again, the idea that adhesion to the personal projects of whoever happens to be the Pope is the key to keeping the church out of trouble doesn't have the same attraction in 2021 as it did in 2007. Pope Francis is playing down of papal prerogatives and prestige over the eight years of his pontificate has not been entirely in vain. Part three, traditionalist Custodes in practice, mass provision. I don't want to suggest that the document will have no effect. Indeed, it already has. And looking at its brief period of implementation up to now gives us some clues about the longer term. It has had immediate practical effects in terms of masses being celebrated or not, and it is it has also had effects on the way the discussion about the traditional mass is being played out in the church. On the celebration of masses, there are some bishops so far, a small number, a very small number, who have felt inspired by the Pope's document to order the complete cessation of celebrations of traditional mass in their dioceses. A few more have reduced the number of masses. Both groups will certainly grow as bishops consider how to implement it on their return from their summer breaks and after consultations. This will cause spiritual distress to many Catholics directly affected by these decisions, and we all feel this. There is nevertheless reason to hope that the great majority of regular celebrations will continue in this country and around the world, and that occasional celebrations such as pilgrimages and weddings will also be possible in most places. You may have to pick your diocese where to get married. 
Latin Mass society has spent the whole of its history negotiating with bishops and assisting priests in politically delicate situations, and this work will clearly continue. It is worth emphasizing that this aspect of our work never came to an end, as some naively imagined it would with some moral pontifical. As a local representative for Oxford, I have been involved in such negotiations throughout the Samorum Pontificum um, period in my own patch. And as chairman of the Latin Mass Society and as secretary of the Una Voce Federation, I have helped other people around England and Wales and around the world involved in the same work. Sometimes we have gained our objective, but more often we did not. I have personally seen a number of appeals under the terms of Samoan Pontificum through priest, bishop, and all the way to, to, the, to Rome. None were immediately successful. Indeed, none of those letters to Rome even received an acknowledgement. It is often felt as though all we were achieving was the creation of a paper trail for the melancholy enjoyment of the historians of the future. Nevertheless, as the years went by, we did make progress, sometimes in unexpected ways. We were chipping away at the resolution of various office holders to keep the ancient mass in its little box. Our polite but insistent letters pointing out the obvious were like drops of water wearing away a stone. The key thing in this situation is not to get discouraged and give up. Try a different request. Try a different parish. Try again with a new priest or a new bishop. Keep it polite, keep it simple, and keep going. That is part of the vocation of an activist for the traditional mass. Some listeners may doubt the efficacy of this work. They may say that any change in attitude on the part of priests and bishops which happened during this time derived from other factors, and that our requests served only to annoy people. However, this is not the case. The traditional mass would not have survived in the decades after 1970 if no lay people had asked for it. The priests who loved it would have said it privately until they died, and that would have been that. The English indult, we all know, was a response to a petition by lay people, and the later indults and Samoan Pontificum addressed the question of how priests and bishops should handle requests from lay people. These requests showed that they were, was an ongoing pastoral problem in refusing lay people the traditional mass and which needed to be addressed somehow. It is the needs of the lay faithful which justify the existence of the traditional priestly institutes and the do donations of the lay faithful which sustain them. It is the continuing spiritual needs of lay people which justify the continuing usage of the 1962 Missal in Traditionis Custodes itself. We may compare our letter writing campaigns in favour our work. Sorry, we may compare our work to letter writing campaigns in favour of prisoners of conscience. I used to participate in, in these when I was at school, when Amnesty International was still about political prisoners and not about its own political agenda. What possible use, one might ask, was writing to President Khrushchev or the military dictators of Burma? What, why should they care about a few letters from foreign countries written by people they'd never heard of? Well, those letter-writing campaigns did not solve all the world's problems, but they had their successes because they made it clear that those prisoners were not being forgotten. The slight discomfort the various leaders felt about how their actions looked was amplified and extended through time. At least in some cases, this was enough to make them change their minds. Even in the darkest days of the movement, our priests and bishops were more sympathetic to Catholic spiritual needs than the apparatchiks of the communist bloc. Uh, it may have seemed different, <laughs> but they still needed to be reminded as time passed that we hadn't simply gone away. If we had gone away, that would have been the end of the movement for the mass. 
We couldn't, when we couldn't get weekly masses, we established annual masses. When we couldn't get Sunday masses, we established masses on first Fridays. We clung on, even with the famous weekday afternoon masses in churches in the middle of nowhere with no loo and no parking. It was ridiculous, but we persevered and we were vindicated. In the time of Traditionis Custodes, whether this turns out to be long or short, the, long, the odds against us are increased. Nevertheless, for several reasons, we are not going back to the situation of the 1970s and 1980s. The movement is in a measurably stronger position now than it was then. We are better resourced and better connected. It is clear today that the demand for the traditional mass is coming from predominantly from the young and not just from the old. And a new generation of priests and also bishops have discovered that traditional mass is not something sterile and oppressive, appealing only to the nostalgic, but something theologically rich and spiritually powerful. <laughs> Part four, the liturgical debate before tradition is custodiated. This takes me to the question of how the liturgical issue will be debated from now on. Up to now, the challenge has been to show that the ancient mass is not incompatible with Vatican II. Back in 2011, I began work on a series of short position papers for the Univoce Federation as the chief writer and editor of a panel of people with much greater expertise than I had myself. This rather dominated my life until the collection of 36 papers was published as a book in 2019. The point of these papers is to vindicate or at least render comprehensible specific aspects of the traditional mass in terms of the post-conciliar magisterium, as well as in terms of the history of the liturgy and wider theological and pastoral considerations. I spent a great deal of time reading official documents about the liturgy, and the papers are larded with references to those documents. Thus, I list about 20 distinct liturgical abuses condemned by official documents which don't arise if early communion is not given under the species of wine. I quote John Paul II and the Catechism of the Catholic Church saying that we should engage with the liturgy not in a purely intellectual way, but contemplatively with our whole person. I quote Pope Paul VI praising Gregorian chant as the key to vocations to the religious life. John Paul II on the need to rediscover silence in the liturgy. The Congregation for Catholic Education warning sternly of the pastoral consequences of the disappearance of Latin. And the Congregation for the Eastern Churches condemning the usual polemic used against the celebration of Mass facing East. The end notes in the book take up 78 pages. Which is great because you don't have to read that. <laughs> Justifying the traditional mass in terms of the modern magisterium has always been a difficult argument to make. However, because there is evidently an important difference between the old order of mass and the new, and the new often seems to be regarded as the crystallization of the thinking of the council, any difference between the two missiles must be, is bound to be regarded with suspicion according to that mindset. Part five, the liturgical debate in Traditionis Custodes. If things were difficult before Traditionis Custodes, now they are more so. On the one hand, it reiterates the idea that the Novus Ordo Missa is the ultimate reference point for the liturgy, saying in Article 1 that it is, and I quote, the only expression of the Lex Arandi of the Roman Missal. Unquote. On the other hand, the accompanying letter to bishops links the Catholics who attend the traditional mass to, and I quote again, the rejection of the church and her institutions. Unquote. Both of these points are very puzzling. The claim that the reform mass is the only lex of the Roman rite seems at first glance like a technical legal point. 
but it doesn't make any sense as that. And I think it must really function as more of a rhetorical gesture to the effect that the old mass is not of any real account. It doesn't have any theological weight. One way of trying to understand it is to look at the published works of the man widely regarded as the author or ghostwriter of Traditiones Custodes, the Italian lay liturgist Andrea Grillo, spelt Grillo, if you want to look him up. I have not been following his work very closely up to now, but I found a review of his book, Beyond Pius V, in, which, was, which came out in 2014. I found it as an interesting idea, and here I quote directly from the book. The reform of the books and rites, of the texts and gestures, is a necessary condition for an authentic experience of the liturgy as fonds. Unquote. Fonds being the Latin for source or fount, as in the famous phrase of Vatican II, that the liturgy is the fonds of the Christian life. As the reviewer, Dom Alcuin Reed, writing in the New Liturgical Movement blog, expresses it, Grillo's view seems to be that, and I quote Dom Alcuin, one cannot truly draw from the sacred liturgy as the source and summit of Christian life other than through these particular ritual reforms. Where that leaves non-Western Catholics or the centuries of worshippers who lived before the 1970s, one can only wonder." Unquote. Grillo certainly seems a plausible source for the claim in Traditionis Custodes that the Reformed Mass is the only expression of the Roman rites lex orandi, but this context doesn't help us understand it as much as we might wish. This is for two reasons. First, we must understand an official text in the context of other official texts and the magisterium as a whole, not in the context of the personal ideas of the humble scribe who drafted it, if indeed he did. Secondly, Grillo's ideas are themselves incomprehensible for the reasons Dom Alcuin adduces. This is simply, there is simply no sense to be made of the idea that the liturgical reform of the 1960s created the one and only authentic form of the mass. Such an idea makes Luther's claim that the church had been in a Babylonish captivity from the time of the church fathers up to the 16th century look modest by comparison. Grier apparently thinks the church never had a proper liturgy until 1969. On the theological deficiencies of the people who attend traditional mass, the characterization of traditionis custodes um, by the tradition of traditional Catholics, found in the letter to bishops, seems to be based on the views of sede vacantists. At least, that is the obvious meaning of the idea of rejecting the church and her institutions. Could someone please tell Pope Francis that people who reject the church and her institutions don't come to masses celebrated in union with a pope which take place with the permission of the local bishop? One could try to understand this phrase in a wider sense to suggest not literal rejection or the like, but the but, um, criticism or something like that. But the strength of its condemnation would be accordingly weakened. Traditional Catholics have criticisms to make of decisions made in the church since 1962. Of course they do, but so do liberal Catholics. We are all permitted to present our own interpretations and objections to non-binding statements coming from Rome. That is what it means to say that they are non-binding. I have books at home criticizing the liturgical reform for being too conservative, for failing to release the creative potential of the people of God, for being, um, and for failing to allow sufficient opportunities for enculturation. Some writers go too far as to talk of a betrayal of the Second Vatican Council by conservative bishops and curial officials. Some of Pope Francis' strongest supporters are associated with such views. If they are allowed to examine the Novus Auto critically, then so are we. 
Again, one can try to get behind the official text to understand what the concerns might be. One idea which has floated past me is that the traditional mass has become associated in a curial mind with criticisms of Pope Francis by the likes of Archbishop Carlo Vignan Vigano. I don't want to get involved in Vigano's views or his reception by elements of the online Catholic world, but I will just point out that he has no real connection with the traditional mass. As far as I am aware, he has never celebrated it, and until very recently, he seems to have had no particular interest in liturgical matters. Something similar is true of many of the most powerful critics of Pope Francis over the years. It was of much greater significance that Amoris Laetitia, for example, was criticised by the late <coughs> Professor Germain Grise and by Father Thomas Wainandi, the Capuchin, than by any number of traditional Catholics, because those two men were deeply embedded in the Catholic establishment in the USA, whereas the Tradies are relatively marginal figures. The biggest bombshell affecting Pope Francis' reputation, in my view, came when Cardinal Sean O'Malley intervened in the case on the issue of the Chilean Bishop Barros in 2018. None of these men had or have the smallest commitment to the traditional mass. Again, the most powerful voices at the 2014 Family Synod opposing what most people assumed was Pope Francis' preferred direction of travel were Cardinal George Powell and Cardinal Robert Sara. As far as I've been able to find out, each of these cardinals has celebrated the traditional mass in public only once. Cardinal Powell in 2014 in Rome and Cardinal Sara in Chartres in 2018. There may have been other occasions, but their eminences are hardly closely integrated into the movement for the traditional mass. Cardinal Sara seems just as happy leading a charismatic celebration in Medjugorje as he was doing earlier this very month. These observations do not exclude the possibility that due to some unfortunate association of ideas, traditional Catholics are being punished for the actions of other people, those who could possibly be described from a partisan point of view as acting in the language of the letter to bishops, and I quote, to widen the gaps, reinforce the divergences, and encourage disagreements that injure the church block her path and expose her to the peril of division." Unquote. However, I am sceptical about this. As I have argued at greater length in the Iota Unum podcast I mentioned earlier, I incline to the view that the key motivation of traditions custodians is not ecclesial politics, but the liturgy. It is the rejection of Pope Benedict's idea, which had been fiercely attacked by Andrea Grillo, among others, that we should consider the new and old masses as able to coexist as two expressions of the Roman rite. The exaltation of the Reform Mass as something which excludes <coughs> everything else is characteristic of a strain of thought among <coughs> progressive liturgists, and it, has, it is this which, for some reason, has, for the moment, gained the upper hand in the corridors of power. The fact that some people attached to the old mass have been a bit annoying, whether it be on Twitter or in defending the church's immemorial discipline on the reception of Holy Communion by the divorced and remarried is a side issue. If tradition is to say his article one is correct, then the traditional mass has got to go, however docile its defenders might be. Part six, the liturgical debate after traditionis custodis. How do we defend ourselves against the accusation that we like attending a mass, which is not the mass, of 1970? This accusation is today being made by people who are convinced that the 1970 mass is the only liturgical form which gives proper expression to the church's teaching and spirituality. Anyone who is facing an opponent whose mind is entirely made up has the option of addressing not him, but the audience. It seems unlikely that we will make a convert of Andrea Grillo, 
although you never know. But we can make arguments and carry on our work for logistical mass in such a way that less ideologically committed people will see us as more reasonable than him. This, indeed, is the approach we have been taking since our foundation in 1965, and this is what we will continue to do. It is interesting to see the publicity work of the founding generation of the Latin Mass Society's activists, such as Professor Alexander Zaina, who wrote in the Catholic Herald in 1969 that since Catholic spiritual needs differed, it was reasonable to allow different liturgical options. The 1971 petition organised by Alfred Marnow for the Society, which was signed by cultural figures, including Agatha Christie, made another argument that the ancient mass could be considered a monument of world culture, such as, as, as the inspiration of so much art, literature and music. Such arguments were not going to move the likes of Annibale Bonini, but they made many reasonable people feel uncomfortable about the suppression of this form of the liturgy, because they point to something obviously true. This mass has value in itself, and for at least some people. This being so, its deliberate destruction seems harsh and unreasonable. There are indeed many good arguments to be made for the preservation of the traditional mass in itself and for the specific celebrations which we help to organize. At this moment of crisis, we take account of the way the debate has developed and of the people who are open or less open to persuasion, but the fundamental task has not changed. We must continue to make the case for the traditional mass in public as politely and insistently as we make it in private to our priests and bishops. One advantage we have today over our predecessors is in the number of celebrations of the traditional mass and the vigor of the movement. In a couple of weeks, our walking pilgrimage to Walsingham will take place with the largest number of pilgrims ever. It looks as though it will be well over a hundred. While parishes are being closed all around us, and one after another, Catholic retreat centre and seminary and Catholic newspaper disappear from the scene, we can see that traditional mass is here to stay. The Latin Mass Society has this message for its members and supporters. We will persevere, and with God's help, we will prevail.